This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. It can be intimidating to read Aquinas, and I'm going to try to teach you how to kind of read Aquinas on your own. Uh, so this is a, a, a sort of, as it were, throwing you in the pool on the shallow end, we hope, uh, with some, some float devices, get a, and get us reading. If you already know how to read Aquinas, you'll, you'll still probably hopefully enjoy it. I want to explain the structure of the Summa and how the thing is set up real quickly. There are four parts to the Summa Theologiae what we call the prima pars, the prima secundae, the secundae secundae, and the tertia pars. That's to say, very simply, the first part, the first part of the second part, the second part of the second part, and the third part. The second part is divided in two because he had so much to deal with with regards to human actions. So in the first part, he, he looks at God, one, and triune, creation, angels, and human beings. And in the second part, the, first, the prima secundae, he looks at human action, the big picture, and then he goes into detail on specific virtues and vices in the secunda secundae. And then in the last part, he treats of Christ and the sacraments. And he died while he was near the end of the treaties on sacraments. We are going to study today the beginning, the very beginning of the tertia pars. That's to say the beginning, the first question of the Christology uh, of Aquinas is thinking about Christ. And in the very first question, of the, summa, of the third part of the Summa, he looks at the question, why, did God, what, why was it fitting that God should become human? Why did God become human? Now, the Summa is divided into questions. Those are kind of the big thematic topics. And then they're composed of articles. So, like in this questiones, there's, questione, there's, one, art, there's one question, but it's composed of six articles. So, what we would call in English a question is actually an article. You know, every article asks a, a provocative question. And so the six articles compose, are six questions that compose this first uh, part of the Summa. In every article, that's subdivided. You could, the guy had a mind like you know, an architectural cathedral. In every, in every, uh, in every article, you have objections uh, that would answer the question one way. And then the said contra, where that means on the contrary. And it's where he gives an argument from authority. So, for example, on the contrary, the Gospel of St. John says. And that then where it shows you where he's going. And then he writes what's called the corpus, or the body of the argument, where he, he gives his real answer to the question, and then he responds to objections. Now, when you read the Summa, a lot of times you get overwhelmed by the apparatus. The key is to just read the main question of each article. I've gotten six questions here. And then you look at the corpus. You look at the main answer. And that's what I'm going to do with you today. And then you can look at the objections and the responses, and that can be that adds something. I am starting in this first question of the Summa Theologiae on the second article. The first article, Aquinas asks, was the incarnation fitting? Was it fitting that God should become human? And he gives, um, I don't, you don't have the text here. He gives a very contemporary argument. He says, whatever God is, God is utterly transcendent of the human race. And we typically, as human beings, create all kinds of false images and ideas about what God is. Consequently, it's dangerous for God to become human because then we will mistake God for a creature. That's the objection he gives. It, it'll create idolatry. We'll, we'll confuse a man or a human being for God, something like that. The objection is Muslim or Jewish. It's a medieval objection that the incarnation is a hindrance to knowing God because it, it makes you lose sight of the transcendence and holiness of God, that he could become human. To become human would banalize our understanding of God. And Aquinas responds in the corpus of that article by saying, the key attribute or property of God under which we should think about the incarnation is God's supreme goodness. That the incarnation is a mystery of God's supreme goodness and love, that he should, out of solidarity with us, become human, become one of us, so that we might know who God is. So Aquinas doesn't deny that God is very transcendent, mysterious, ineffable, unknown in many ways, high above our comprehension. But he says, because he is all those things, it is supremely fitting and wise that God should become human so that we can, as it were, perceive the human face of God. So that he could, as it were, cross the, 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 the gulf of transcendence and be born in a crib or manger 
and even suffer a human life like ours, even unto death, and a cruel death of that, in solidarity with us so that we might see who God is. And this is an expression of God's goodness. So the argument then is, it is fitting for God to become human. Then he asks a more subtle, that's beautiful, and it makes sense, right? We understand that. If you go to Christmas Mass, you understand when you look at the child, it's mind-boggling to think God became a baby. But it is seemingly fitting because it shows you the deep goodness and mercy of God. But then he asks a more subtle question, a kind of more aggressive theological question. But was it necessary? If God was going to save us, did he have to do it this way? Could God have saved the human race without becoming human? Now that is where you start to get into questions of what salvation is. What is God about? What is he up to in the incarnation? And one of the things I want to get into in the second lecture today is more about the peculiarities of Christian claims about salvation. I mean, that God wants to save the human race. He becomes human, but it's certainly not a magic wand version of salvation where he uh, simply waves away all the evil of human existence. As we're all too frequently and punctually reminded, there's great moral and physical evil that remains present in the human race and in fact in ourselves. And so however we understand the incarnation, uh, it's got to be related to how we understand what God's doing in salvation. Okay, so that's a, giving you a big theme we're going to explore a little bit more today. So when he asks whether the incarnation was necessary for human salvation, he gives a big kind of prologue here. In his, this, is, in, this is the corpus. This is the main answer of the article. And then he's going to talk about two ways the incarnation has helped us or why it saved us for furtherance in the good and for removal from evil, withdrawal from evil. So I'm going to go through it with you. I'm going to actually just read the article and comment on it bit by bit. I answer that a thing can be said to be necessary for a certain end in two ways. First, when the end cannot be without it, as food is necessary for the preservation of human life. It's that straightforward. Do you need to eat in order to live? Indeed. Secondly, when the end is attained better and more conveniently, as a horse is necessary for a journey. Now, this is a, a joke in a certain way when he says this in a medieval context, because Dominicans were different from other clergy, the diocesan clergy in the Middle Ages, because Dominicans had a rule that they were, uh, in fact, to walk everywhere, while other clergy could sometimes ride horses. And it was onerous. It's thought that in Thomas Aquinas' own life, he probably walked 10,000 miles. Uh, and he actually died while walking. It sort of seems that he had a stroke. Um, so when you say to a, a room full of Dominican friars, it's necessary, there's another kind of necessity in the way it'd be necessary to have a horse for a journey. They know it's not very necessary. I mean, in other words, you could, you could, but they know it's very inconvenient to not have a horse. Right. Okay. So that just interesting context in the first way, it was not necessary that God should become incarnate for the restoration of human nature for God by his omnipotent power could have restored the human nature of uh, human nature in many other ways. God could have saved us in any many numbers of creative ways. God is infinite, God is infinitely wise, God has a lot of resources, he has a lot of time on his hands. He, in fact, when he created time, he made a lot of it because he's eternal and he's very patient. But in the second way, it was necessary that God should become incarnate for the restoration of the human nature, of human nature. Hence, Augustine says, and he's quoting Augustine as an authority for medieval think thinkers, we shall also show that other ways were not wanting to God, he could have done it otherwise, to whose power all things are equally subject, but that there was not a more fitting way of healing our misery. Okay, so Aquinas is making um, a strong version of a weak claim. <laughs> He's saying it's not necessary that God become incarnate to save us, but it is highly fitting. And it's much more, con the, the word in Latin is conveniens. It means convenient, but it also means highly fitting, uh, highly appropriate. And think about the difference between taking the metro versus walking the island of Manhattan, right? I mean, you can get there by walking, but mm, much more convenient to take the metro. That's sort of the idea, right? So the incarnation is really uh, kind of moving us along into God in the most expedient, convenient way. 
Now, he then creates what are called like kind of two tables of thinking. One is about the positive advancement in the good, and the second one is about withdrawal from evil. And we're going to go through these because they're very beautiful and they're very profound. And they tie in with Aquinas' sort of deeper vision of salvation and the human personhood. The first thing I want to note to you is that when Aquinas talked, he's going to kind of pursue this thesis that this is the most convenient way for God to save us. The first thing I want to note is he, he starts with the emphasis on the positive. Salvation is about Christ saving us from human sin, but that's interestingly the very last thing that Aquinas is going to say. He's going to talk first about the fact that it's about God creating the conditions of our happiness. God became a human being so that we could be happy, so that we could be beatified, so that we could live our life with God. So it's, it's, you know, it's just refreshing that the greatest of medieval Catholic theologians should say the primary mystery of salvation is a mystery of God advancing us or moving us upward into life. It's that the incarnation is a mystery of God communicating his life of grace to us. So we're going to look at that. Now this may be viewed with respect to our furtherance in the good, how it's fitting. First, with regards to faith, which is made more certain by believing God himself who speaks. He means like who speaks to you in a human voice with human words. So Augustine says in the city of God, in order that man might journey more trustfully toward the truth, the truth itself, the son of God, having assumed a human nature, established and founded faith. Right, so for, there's lots in the background here. If you were at Father Legg's talk that was a month ago, you know he talked about faith being an enlightenment of the human intellect that allows you to know God personally. The great, we're talking about supernatural faith. Supernatural faith is an enlightenment of the mind. It's a grace given into the human intellect that allows us to know who God is. So if I have received baptismal faith, for example, I am able to make an act of faith in Christ as a reality. If I'm sitting around the water cooler and people at the office or at the cafe or in the classroom are saying, you know, these Christians are crazy. They believe all this stuff. Some part of me knows that's not right. My sensus fide, the sense of the faithful, is telling me, no, actually, they don't realize Jesus exists or that Christ is present in the Blessed Sacrament or that the church is something real, a real mystery. Right? That knowledge, that dark but obscure but real knowledge, is knowledge given by grace. And that grace of faith is nourished in us by the presence of Christ among us in the Incarnation, in an especial way because we can, as it were, have living contact with Christ, who has become one of us, who is even present among us mysteriously in his resurrection, in the preaching of the gospel, in the sacraments. It nourishes our faith. And what is faith for? Well, in this life, it's for belief. And in the life to come, it's for vision. The faith is like a tractor beam of the mind, gentle and unviolent, drawing us into the presence of God so that we can, in the world to come, see God face to face. Faith is already a kind of seeing. It's an intuitive knowledge that allows us to see into the mystery of the Trinity even in this life, in view of vision of the Trinity in the life to come. And so the Trinity has encouraged us by one of the Trinity becoming one of us. God has taken on our life so that God can communicate his life to us, nourishing our faith. Mm. Okay, so that's the big idea at the beginning. Secondly, with regards to hope, which is thereby greatly strengthened, Augustine says, nothing was so necessary for raising our hope as to show us how deeply God loved us. Now, this is a conversation priests have often. It goes something like this. Father, given what I've done, it's not possible that God could possibly love me, etc., etc. I am particularly, uh, you know, fallen, ashamed, wicked, have done something wrong, da, 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 da. And the priest can simply respond like this saying, this is not a theoretical question. The answer to this question has already been given 2,000 years ago. He died for you on the cross, and so he has died to take away our sins and to restore us to life in him. All right, so the, crucifix, the incarnation and crucifixion become principle of hope. We can have hope in God in all circumstances of life because God became human and even suffered death and made from that death, uh, you know, the the new creation of resurrection. 
Julian of Norwich, the 14th century uh, mystic, English mystic, says, the worst possible thing that ever could have happened has happened. We have killed God. And God has drawn from it the best possible thing that might ever be, which is that he's communicated to us eternal life. So we've already done the worst thing we could do. And from that very worst thing we could do, God's already given us the greatest thing he can give. And so there are grounds for hope. Thirdly, with regards to love or charity, the grace of charity poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is greatly enkindled by this, since Augustine says, what greater cause is there of the Lord's coming than to show his love for us? Right, so the incarnation is to spurn on love. You might say the time of this life, which is a time of trial for Aquinas, is a time of opportunity to love, to choose to love while we're free before the judgment comes. And it's also the, therefore the time to render our lives holy. It's, it's easy to love when, you know, God is right in your face. It's easy to love when everything's going well, but when you're in the middle of armed combat, spiritually speaking, spiritual combat, the choice to love is a new choice every day. And the choice to grow in love is a new choice every day. And so the incarnation is there to encourage us that Christ has opened for us in this world, a way of charity, a way of love to grow in charity. Then he talks about Christ's example as the fourth reason that Christ has taught us how we ought to live. That's the notion of um, imitatio Christi in the Latin, the imitation of Christ. It's a thematic work, of course, of Thomas Akempis, that Christ, God became human so that we would have a, an exemplar, an example, an idea of how we ought to live in this world. And fifthly, this is kind of the apex of the whole thing. He's given us faith, hope, and charity. He's encouraged us in faith, hope, and charity to follow the example of Christ so that we might be united with the divinity and participate in the life of God himself. So he says this, fifthly, with regards to the full participation of the divinity, which is the true bliss of man and end of human life. Bliss, don't take bliss there too psychologically. He means like the deep spiritual happiness of the human being. Like what really at the depths of ourselves makes us happy is to know God and see God. And that's what beatifies. That's what means makes us blessed. We will be, we will be beatified. We'll be blessed in heaven when we see God face to face. And so the God became human so that we might become united with God by grace and be beatified, blessed. And this is bestowed on us by Christ's humanity. Augustine says in a pithy way, God was made man that man might be made God. Now, that's a great theme in ancient Christian thought, specifically uh, in Athanasius of Alexander, Athanasius, uh, St. Athanasius of the fourth century, who argued that the primary motive of the incarnation was our divinization. God became man to unite us to God. And the idea here is like, it's, a, it's an idea of fittingness. God could, God could make us blessed by grace without having become human. But if God can become human, he can definitely give us heaven. If you say, well, God can't beatify us, you know, grace can't really be that real. It's, it's just too much evil in the world. God can't deal with, cope with it all. I mean, or if, he, if, he, if he wants to cope with it all, he hasn't shown himself very interested to do so. But see, if he's become human, then he can, right? I mean, so it's a kind of proportion, an argument from proportion. God has done something so disproportionately baffling as to become human. That shows us that God can do something uh, that's you know, relatively, quote unquote, easier, which is to give us intimate knowledge of God. If God can become human, then I can be friends with God. That's kind of the idea. Now, he says it's also useful, the incarnation, for our withdrawal from evil. So he doesn't, it's not Pollyanna. He puts the positive stuff first. Then he turns to the remedy of our human condition. First, because man is taught by it not to prefer the devil to himself nor to honor him who is the author of sin. Hence, Augustine says, since human nature is so united to God as to become one person, Jesus is the person of the son made man. Let not these proud spirits of the devils prefer, uh, dare, dare to prefer themselves to man because they have no bodies. Okay, this is a very interesting, now that, this is like really high medieval thinking. Right? We're not usually thinking about the devil and angels and spirits. But the idea is really interesting. It's that, the human being is tempted in our human condition 
to see our mortality, our, our physical limitation, our physical suffering as a sign of dependency on the spiritual world and therefore to render honor to the spiritual world in ways that are um, confused, disoriented, and false. In other words, we gen human beings down through time generate religions. And it's natural in a way to be human, to be religious. But Aquinas is saying, but there's a lot of ways human religion goes wrong. I mean, I'm not trying to be polemical, but we saw an aspect, we saw an example of this yesterday. It was very poignant. It's what Aquinas would call superstition, serving God in the wrong way. And sometimes it's really the wrong way. And so Aquinas is saying that part of the way that we stop serving the spiritual world wrongly is by, look, is by knowing how to serve the God rightly. And the incarnation has given us, has opened the right avenues. He's thinking also of the sacraments, that by becoming human and instituting the church and the sacraments, God has given us the kind of safe highway of how to approach God in a right way. And it's taught us then to love ourselves. It's also taught us to value our own bodies. And one of the mysteries of our life is that we suffer physically and we die. And it's easy to think about the body disparagingly. Now, that's not our American culture. Our American culture is the cult of, you know, exercise, human sexuality, the body's good, the body's great, until it isn't. Uh, and then we try to prop it up with medicine and plastic surgery and, you know, a lot of special care, and then eventually we get into mortality reluctantly. But this is a deeper view of the human body, that the human body can be a place to glorify God. And that that's, that's something that the incarnations made clear to us. Glorify God in your body. Do not prefer the devil to yourself. God didn't choose to become an angel. He became a human being. So we are special to God and the human body is special to God. Secondly, because we are thereby taught how great is man's dignity, lest we should soil our human dignity with sin. And so he quotes Pope Leo from the famous Christmas sermon of Pope Leo, which religious and monks Read every year, learn, O Christian, thy worth, and being made a partner of the divine nature, refuse to return by evil deeds to your former worthlessness. I mean, Pope Leo says, if God became human, you have such value. You have such dignity. He says, Christian, remember your dignity. That's sometimes how it's translated. Christian, remember your dignity. God has become human, so you have incredible dignity. It's a deep view of human dignity. Now, incidentally, just in passing, this was exactly the argument used by another great pope, John Paul II, in the face of communism in his first encyclical Redemptor Ominis in 1979, where he laid the emphasis on the intrinsic dignity of each human being because of the incarnation, because God became human. And so the state can never violate human dignity in the name of a kind of omnipotence of the state. The state is always relative to the mystery of God. This is obviously in the context of the polemics with communism, emphasizing with the solidarity movement the dignity of each human being. It's just interesting to see how from Pope Leo in the 5th century to Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century to John Paul II in our own time, this powerful idea of theology has been so liberating and so important, even to like very concrete, uh, in very concrete political ways. Thirdly, because in order to do away with man's presumption or, or pride, the grace of God is commended in Jesus Christ through no merits of who, though no merits of ours went before. I mean, so the incarnation makes it clear if we're saved, it's not because of something we did. It's because of an initiative God has taken. Right. What do you have? St. Paul says that you have not received. What do you have that you have not received? And that is not a humiliating viewpoint. That's a liberating viewpoint from the perspective of gratitude. The idea that I become, by my Christian faith, a being of gratitude because I've been given so much by God. Right? And so instead of um, thinking of all the things we you know, are limited by, thinking also of all things we've been given. It's a very challenging and, sp and deep uh, motif. Fourthly, because man's pride, which is the great stumbling block to our clinging to God, can be convinced and cured by humility so great. The great parable of the incarnation is a parable of humility. If you look at Philippians chapter 2, it says, Though he was in the form of God, God did not deem, Christ did not deem, though he was in the form of God, Christ did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but he humbled himself, taking the form of a slave, taking the form of man, and being in human form, 
became obedient even unto death. And Paul is commending there in, in the second chapter of Philippians that we imitate Christ, that he who served in humility, the whole human race, we should seek uh, to imitate in serving one another in humility. So this like parable of deep humility that's a remedy to our uh, erroneous pride. And last, just as he ended the, the, the list of positive goods with the theory of divinization, which is the great Eastern theory of redemption. God became human to divinize us. He ends the list of uh, removals of privations with the great theory of salvation of the West, which is that of St. Anselm uh, in his book, Why Did God Become Human? Cur Deus Homo. It's a famous treatise of St. Anselm for the 11th century. And he gives that, he doesn't name him here, but that's his, it's, he gives the theory here. Fifthly, in order to free man from the enslavement of sin, which, as Augustine says, ought to be done in such a way that the devil should be overcome by the justice of the man, Jesus Christ. And this was done by Christ atoning for us. Now, the word is you put in the English translation, you're satisfying because the word in Latin is satisfactio. But the word satisfactio means like what we might call atonement, making reparation. Christ made reparation for us. Now, he gets in the argument here, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Now, a mere man could not have made atonement or satisfied for the whole human race, our, our sins. But God was not bound to satisfy. I mean, God has no obligation to make atonement to himself. So we, here's the idea. You and I are all very finite, and we are unfortunately marred by original sin, and even, if I may say so, a few personal sins of our own. So we can't go out and sort of fix the problems of the human race. Like, you know, God, I volunteer to be pristine for the human race and save humanity. No, it's ridiculous. And even collectively, we can't do it because we're, we're sort of part of the, well, we're sort of part of the problem, if you see what I mean. And God doesn't really have any obligation to do it because, I mean, God making atonement to himself as God doesn't make much sense. And so it's fitting, it's not necessary, but fitting that God should become human and as one of us, atone for us, that God should become our brother, and that he should lead us as the pioneer, so to speak, out of the slavery of sin and into the light of grace. And so Christ, God is so merciful that he fixes our human condition from within. That's the idea here. And hence Pope Leo says in the same sermon, weakness is assumed by strength, lowliness, lowliness by majesty, mortality by eternity in order that one and the same mediator of God and men might die in one, die as man, and rise by the power of his divinity. Unless he was God, he would not have brought a remedy. Unless he was man, he would not have set an example. So because he's human, the idea is because he's human, Christ can atone for our sins as one of us. He sets our human condition right. right? We can point at at least one person and we say, he has lived as we ought to live. And because he's God... There's something of infinite dignity to his death, to his incarnation, to his act, human life, to his human death. Christ has, there's a kind of infinite holiness to Christ because he's God who has lived as a human being the mystery of obedience and love there where you and I have failed to love and failed to obey. And so there's a kind of infinite mystery to our infinite dignity to the death of Christ, to his life and death. And God doesn't need that, as it were, to make to restore the order of justice. But it's a sort of fitting, beautiful way for God to do things. That God looks upon us with such mercy that he gives us his own justice. He clothes us in his own justice so that we can partake of his own righteousness. So the idea here is not that God had to fix things by becoming just on our part. He had to become just on our behalf. Because otherwise, um, he just couldn't really have looked at us with any mercy. It's like, okay, fir first things, I've got I've to set things straight with justice, and then we'll talk about having mercy on the wretched human race. No, it's the opposite. It's that God has such mercy on the human race that he doesn't just save us out of mercy. He's, he's so merciful that he saves us in justice. He becomes one of us, and then he communicates to us justification, the grace of justification. And we're justified by faith, hope, and charity. So when we live in faith in Christ, in hope in Christ, and in love of Christ, we partake of Christ's own justice, his own grace as man. And we follow him, the pioneer of our life in God. We follow Christ uh, into righteousness. All right, I'm going to just finish this first talk. I'm going to open up the questions about six or seven minutes. 
But I'm just going to finish this first talk by looking at another, um, what's actually, I have it as Roman numeral number two, but as it says on the sheet, it's actually article three. Okay, that's very beautiful, St. Thomas Aquinas. You have all these good reasons that it's fitting that God should become human to save us. But would God have become incarnate had human beings never fallen into sin? Is the incarnation itself primarily oriented towards our salvation? Or would God have become incarnate had we never sinned? Now that sounds like a, you know, kind of purely hypothetical question. But what Aquinas is trying to get is this issue. Did God create the world from the beginning in view of the incarnation? Did God make everything in order to become incarnate so he would have done it anyway? And as it were, he's now done it in a way that completes creation and redeems us from sin? Or did God create the world for some other reason and then because we sinned, become incarnate? Now, this is a famous theological argument down to the ages, and I'm sure some of you know that there's a famous d dispute here. <laughs> Duns Scotus argues famously against Aquinas that God created in order to become incarnate and would have become incarnate anyway. So the incarnate, that God made the world in order to become incarnate, and many people, many people hold this view. I mean, it's a totally permitted view in Catholic theology, and many people see the incarnation of Christ as sort of the, the center of the universe, the kind of monstrance, you know, just like we look at a monstrance, there's the Holy Eucharist there. Like the, the whole universe is a sort of monstrance in which Christ's incarnation shines through as the centerpiece of all creation, and God intended it ever so from the beginning. That's a beautiful idea. But Aquinas does not think the purpose of the incarnation, of the, of the creation, was the incarnation. He does not think the central mystery of creation is the incarnation. Doesn't that sound impious? What could it possibly be then? Aquinas thinks the central mystery of the creation is the Trinity. And that God created us not in order to become human, but in order to give us God. God created us so that we could see God face to face and know the Trinity. And it's because we failed in the first instance to correspond to the, you might call it, to the heights of that calling, that then God descended into the depths of our condition so that we could be re-elevated into the life of the Trinity. That's also really beautiful. These are, this is the privilege of studying theology. You get into beautiful conundrums between competing visions of the beauty of God's work. Cardinal Cajetan Cardinal figured out the answer to all this, in my opinion, but uh, I'll come to that in a minute. So let me just read the Corpus article, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you some thoughts. Now, Aquinas does not say things quite so bluntly as I just said them. He says, I answer that there are different opinions about this question. For some say that even if man had not sinned, the Son of Man would have become incarnate. Others assert the contrary. And seemingly, our assent ought rather to be given to this opinion. Now, notice he's cautious. He doesn't say it's just straightforward. He says, I think it's probably the latter view. Now he's going to try to justify that. For such things as spring from God's will and beyond the creatures do, or what, we're, what God did, owes us, you might say, can be known to us only through being revealed in sacred scripture in which the divine will is made known to us. So what he's saying is first is like, how do we know the answer to this question anyway? What God would have done had we never sinned? We have to look at sacred scripture because we don't have like access behind the veil to go back into God's mind and know what he would have done in a hypothetical counterfactual. You know, well, you know, if I were God, I would have become incarnate anyway. So, you know, we don't have that kind of knowledge. You don't have access. So what does scripture teach you? What has God revealed to you? He says, hence, since everywhere in the sacred scripture, the sin of the first man is assigned as the reason for the incarnation. It is more in accordance with this to say that the work of the incarnation was ordained by God as a remedy for sin. So that had sin not existed, the incarnation would not have been. Okay, so he's saying, if you look at the motives of the incarnation as in St. Paul and in Scripture, it seems that what Scripture teaches is that God became man because of our, our, to redeem us, to save us. And incidentally, that's in the creed. For us men and for our salvation, he became man. All bow their head. Right? Right, that's the creed saying that the motive of the incarnation is to save us from sin. So Augustine, I mean, Aquinas is on some pretty strong ground there, but then he adds this thought, and yet the power of God is not limited to this. Even had sin not existed, God could have become incarnate. So he does leave it open. He says, well, God could have become incarnate if he'd wanted at the heart of the creation, 
but it seems from scripture, from what we can tell that he did it in order to save us. So it's very epistemologically humble. He's just saying we can't absolutely know, but it seems likely from scripture to say that, you know, this is, this is the more probable position. Now, I'm just going to finish by mentioning to you that it, historically, this is sometimes called the conflict between the Franciscan school and the Dominican school, because lots, most typically Franciscans follow Scotus in thinking the incarnation is the God would become, the God created in order to become incarnate. And Dominicans defend the, the tradition that I've elaborated, that God created us for knowledge of the Holy Trinity and then descended in our condition to save us, to elevate us back up into life in the Trinity. But that being said, that's complicated. St. Bonaventure, contemporary of Thomas Aquinas, held that God became incarnate uh, in order to save us. And Bonaventure is, of course, a great, one of the great Franciscans. Albert the Great, Dominican, professor who taught Thomas Aquinas, held that God became incarnate uh, as the central uh, motive of the, of the creation, that God would have become incarnate anyway. So uh, actually Aquinas is agreeing with his contemporary Bonaventure and disagreeing with his teacher, uh, Albert the Great. So it, the, the inner debate is even inside the orders. So it's not just Franciscans versus Dominicans. And Cajetan, uh, Cardinal Cajetan was a great, probably the greatest Catholic theologian of the 16th century, debated with Luther, uh, was one, one of the people to revise the study of Aquinas in the early Renaissance period. And, and Cajetan has a beautiful, th he, he debated a lot with Scotists on this issue, in, in, incidentally. And his has a, I'll finish with his idea, which is very beautiful. Cajetan starts with Aquinas' idea. Yes, God became, from what we can see in scripture and from the fitting arguments that Aquinas gives, we can see that God created us for knowledge of the Trinity and when we fell, became hum a human being to unite us with him once again and to save us from sin. So the motive of the incarnation, the reason God became human is our sal for our salvation. And there's no reason to think necessarily that God would have become incarnate had we not sinned. But when God does become incarnate, he glorifies the universe more than it ever would have been had he not become incarnate. And so, in a certain way, what we see God doing is making use even of our failures and of our shortcomings in God's infinite mercy to give us a yet greater bestowal of grace than he ha would have had we never fallen. So there's a certain way in which God makes use of the fault to go further in mercy and show us his ever greater goodness, even to the point of making the universe more beautiful in some respects, at least, and more profoundly attuned to God by the mystery of the incarnation, completing in a certain way, fulfilling the creation from within. You know, so that's an interesting position that says that in a certain way, what God has given us in the incarnation and in Christ is greater than what God would have given us it's in some ways greater for God to become a human being than, if, than what would have happened in the first creation had we never sinned. And so God's mercy is creative. It's a very interesting view. This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. What I want to talk about in this second section, I mean, we've got the big picture really in a way of, of sort of the motives of the incarnation, but then what about the timing? Why has God become incarnate at the very time he did? Or you might say, Aquinas says, why didn't he become incarnate at the very beginning of history? Why didn't God become, wait until the very end of history to become incarnate? So what is it about becoming, God becoming man in the middle of human history in all of its grayness, its messiness, uh, its imperfection, uh, in the midst of a great deal of moral turpitude? And that's connected, of course, to the question of how God saves us. I mean, if God enters into, you might say, the sort of mystery of human history in the middle of its difficulties and, and fragilities and struggles, how is he redeeming us? Or is he really redeeming us? If he's really redeeming us, why is there a perpetual problem or mystery of evil and death in the world? How does he overcome those things? And I'm going to add a question that's not in the Summa about why God became incarnate only once. That's not, that's, that, why aren't there multiple avatars of the divinity? This is a kind of Hindu question. I mean, it's a question in relation to uh, sort of the Hindu tradition that's worth asking. 
but which some modern theologians have speculated on. Okay. So if you go back to your handout, I have here uh, Article 5, and it's under, it's under Roman numeral 3. Why didn't God become incarnate at the beginning of history? And I've added, why in media res? Why in the midst of things? And I'm going, again, as usual, right to the corpus, uh, let's say the body of the article, the answer. It was fitting that God should become incarnate immediately after sin. It was, nor was it fitting that God should become incarnate immediately after sin. In, order, in other words, it's not reasonable in a certain way, or it's not most perfect for God to have immediately redressed the situation of human sinfulness by becoming incarnate in the generation after our first parents uh, somehow severed themselves from the mystery of God's grace. First, on account of the manner of man's sin, which had come of pride. Hence, man was to be liberated in such a manner that he might be humbled and see how he stood in need of a deliverer. For first of all, God left man under the natural law with the freedom of his will in order that he might know his natural strength. And when he failed in it, he received the law, whereupon by the fault, not of the law, but of his nature, the disease gained strength so that having recognized his infirmity, he might cry out for a physician and beseech the aid of grace. There's a lot here. When Aquinas talks about the natural law, he's not first and foremost thinking about external legal precepts. No. He's thinking about deep inclinations. I mean, Aquinas has this place where he says the deepest inclinations in us are the inclination to preserve and safeguard human life, to live in community and seek friendship, and to seek the ultimate truth about reality, including the truth about God. So these are in some way inalienable features of human existence. He says be, human beings cannot not want to be happy. They can do incredibly ridiculous things in order to try to con convincing themselves that this is the way to be happy. And if they don't find happiness, they can try to end their own lives as a, as a, as a remedy to relieve, relieve themselves from the burden of unhappiness. But that is the drive for happiness is at the core of the human being, and it's inalienable. And it filters out through the desire to preserve our own life, to preserve ourselves from pain, to advance in what's good for our own natural kind, and to form bonds of friendship, to live in community and dependence upon one another. We, we can't really be happy without friends and without healthy, some kind of healthy relationships with other people. And there's vast webs of interdependence that grow up from that through family life, through society, through work and education. And he says, ultimately, we have a natural desire to want to know what it's all about. The search for wisdom, the search for explanation drives the human intellect. So that whether we end up mistakenly thinking that atheism is the answer to what it's all about, that there is no, no explanation other than material causes and physical things, or whether we have mistaken views about the deity, the truth of the matter is we are always asking why questions, or at least we're able always, we're always able to ask why questions. Okay, so that's the natural law. And the thing is, in the midst of all that, we do gain sparks of insight into moral truth. I mean, even the most, the person most bereft of moral compass or moral orient orientation has some capacity to grasp the good and to avoid evil. It's really hard to be consistently evil about everything. So, I mean, we, we can make big mistakes about some things. It's very hard to always make big mistakes about everything. There's like deeply ingrained patterns in us so that even people who might tell a big lie might come back and think about it afterwards and think that they have a remorse of the conscience. And the life of virtues and vices, the life of virtues is to ward off vices and to become more stable and fixed in the good, like thinking, you know, I told that big lie, I have remorse of conscience. I think I should try to build up a habit of always being truthful in all circumstances, even when it's a little awkward socially, because I don't really want to get caught in that kind of behavior pattern again. So I'm going to try to build up the habit of being a truth teller. That doesn't mean all truth is good to say, but it means that when I do say things, I'm going to try to say things that are true. Right? So you can go from basic inclinations to kind of sparks of moral insight to building up virtues. But when you live life historically in real time, you, re you realize how frail that is in yourself and other people. And that's often even with baptism. So his claim is that uh, he, after the fall, it's not that God left the human race to itself. He did give, Aquinas thinks God gave grace from the beginning to all human beings, initiatives of grace. But that he also left human beings, uh, he let them experience their poverty. Because the original sin is a sin of pride, 
the human race has a deep inclination towards pride. All of us have a deep inclination towards pride to not want to have to depend upon God, to admit moral, um, our moral faults, to accept our dependency upon other people and our need to grow in understanding often when we're confused and we are often confused and in moral strength when we're weak and we are often weak. Right? So the experience, you know, so this idea is that it's not just that you let one individual, you know, the, the, the direct descendants of the first parents learn their fragilities. It's that you let a human civilization grow up where the human race knows that it's poor and weak. And Augustine doesn't think God's a sadist at all in this. He thinks God's, which Aquinas thinks God's very merciful in doing this because he says, letting human beings, he says elsewhere, letting human beings experience the frailty of their moral state and even the mortality of death allows them to uh, find God. If God had left us strong, then we would feel that we could live our life forever without God. And living your life forever without God is a state we call hell. It could begin already in this life by rupturing with God definitively. So the ex letting us experience the limits of our nature is not willing us to be miserable. It's letting us go off and be ourselves without God long enough to realize it's not working out. All right, so that's the kind of big idea. Now, this is also true, of course, often in our own lives individually, that there's a kind of economy of mercy where God, if we decide we want to have nothing to do with the mystery of Christ, we find out through hitting the hard corners of reality that it has its sharp edges. And uh, we acquire, you know, knowledge of our own limitation and misery. But, you know, the good news is in this way of thinking that there's a time there's a time of redemption, and we will come to that time, or we can come to that time with God. So, time is both in many ways a, a troublesome a, um, burden. You have to withstand the duration of your existence, and there's lots of moments of maybe emptiness or boredom or bemusement or uh, frustration, but it's also a t time gives opportunities of finding God. Of encountering God. And the incarnation is the time God gave to the human race of coming to realize they could be saved. The time of finding a savior. Okay, so that's it's an argument from fittingness. It's not saying he couldn't have become incarnate right away. He could have become incarnate right away. But there's a kind of way that God uses human history and human time in our own lives individually and collectively as a whole human race. So we look out across the broad expanse of history and we say, well, Christ is a pretty good option. I've read Socrates. He's great. Plato's wonderful. Aristotle's better. <laughs> but Christ is the best. You look across the horizon of history and you see the, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ as the, the, the lighthouse on the horizon of history, giving perspective to everything, casting a light upon the whole landscape. Second, um, he says, on account of the order of furtherance in the good, whereby we proceed from imperfection to perfection. And so the apostle says, yet that was not first which is spiritual, but what is natural. Afterwards, that which is spiritual. The first man was of the earth, earthy. The second man from heaven, heavenly. So that's a kind of idea of how God uses history pedagogically to teach us to move from the imperfect to the perfect. It's true even on a natural level. He doesn't say this. But even on the natural level, we move from the imperfect to the perfect. Paul famously says, when I was a child, I uh, did childish things. Now I'm an adult. I do adult things. I, I'm going to feed you the milk of children. But when you grow a bit greater, stronger as a Christian, I'll feed you the strong meat of Christianity. Right? So the, the human body matures. The human person matures. We move from less you know, perfect state to more perfect state. But God recapitulates that in human history and in our own lives in the order of grace. We can move from the less perfect state of being a human being according to nature to being a human being according to supernature or according to grace, to live the life of Christ in our own lives. Again, it's just an argument from fittingness. God has done it this way. Aquinas said God did become human in the midst of history. So why did he do it? Well, one thing is it's a kind of pedagogy that the human race can move progressively from the imperfect to the perfect. Thirdly, on account of the dignity of the incarnate word, but when the fullness of time has come, a, a gloss, that means a, common, a medieval commentary, a common commentary, 
up on the Bible at the middle in the Middle Ages, says the greater judge of who was coming, the more numerous was the band of heralds who ought to have preceded him. Now that is a very interesting kind of comment about the Old Testament. He's just saying, look at how God did things. He sent prophets for a long time to prepare. And so when God begins to act in the world, he sort of starts in first, you know, motifs, you might say, of a, it's kind of, you thought in in terms of a a musical symphony that God would build with a a simpler melody or simpler harmonies. And then he builds up to the final movement of the symphony. There's a kind of fittingness there because it teaches you to hear the music. Okay, God is speaking through prophets. God is building on what he's done in Moses. God is now speaking in Isaiah. And the crescendo and the sort of whole symphony happen in the New Testament with Christ and the apostolic college and then the beginning of the church. Uh, So the thing builds and it's a way you begin to see how God is doing things in history. Fourthly, lest the fervor of faith should cool by the length of time for the charity of many will grow cold at the end of the world. Now that's in the New Testament itself in Luke 18. It is written, yet the son of man, when he comes, shall he, shall, you know, shall he find, thank you, faith on earth. That's the gospel actually from today for the mass. So it's the idea that even when God gives the plenitude of the revelation, he still allows us to refuse the light. That's the first words of John's gospel. In the prologue, he says the light was coming into the world by which all men are enlightened. But he says the, the darkness did not comprehend it. And to those who he came, many rejected him. So there's a weird mystery that even when God reveals himself in the incarnation, it still engages with our human freedom. And there's a certain fittingness that the kind of battle between light and darkness goes on through history. And God doesn't give all the light at the beginning. He gives the light in the midst of our darkness. And then we we can begin to uh, uh, assimilate to it or refuse it. And the mystery of the church is this kind of mystery of the acceptation or refusal of the light down through time of Christ's friends and of those who feel threatened by Christ. I mean, Christ is a figure of division. He's also the greatest figure of unity. He's the definitive figure of unity, but it can't be hidden also that the gospel divides sometimes. Now, the fifth reason I've given you is actually about why he didn't become, it's from the next article, the last article, should God have become incarnate only at the end of the world? And there he says, um, he says no, and he has a lot of reasons, but I just, it's the pithy, this slight this sentence here at the end is one of the most beautiful statements of this entire treatise, this first question. He says, the work of incarnation to be, to be viewed, I think it is to, so it should be, is to be viewed, not, me, not as merely the terminus of a movement from imperfection to perfection, but also as a principle of perfection to human nature. Now, I'll just read it again. The work of incarnation is to be viewed not as merely the terminus, the term of a movement from imperfection to perfection, but also as a principle of perfection. And when he says principle, he means a cause. He's talking about an engine. So he's saying, why didn't Christ become incarnate at the end of the world? Because the incarnation has effects in history. It changes the world. So God waited long enough, as it were, so that we realized our need for a savior, but he, came in, he became incarnate in the middle of things so that he could change us. There is a principle of perfection at work in the world. And that principle of perfection is Christ incarnate, uh, crucified and raised from the dead. And so the Christ acts in the world, in the church, in the sacraments to perfect the lives of the saints and to render a new life possible for the human race. That's a beautiful little phrase there. He became human to be a principle of perfection to human nature. Right, so it's to give us on the great horizon of history this sort of anchor of hope that God has sort of uh, uh, taken territory uh, and, and started to expand his, his kingdom. This is a great image that C.S. Lewis used when he was giving the lectures that became mere Christianity in the, in the ambiance of the Second World War, where he talked about the incarnation as the beachhead of God landing on Normandy. And, and expanding, you know? So it's this idea that, you know, we're not really in tune with God, but he's come, he's come among us in a certain way to conquer us, to conquer the territory. And uh, the, the incarnation happens in the middle of time as this first beachhead of the church coming out to expand the kingdom of Christ among human beings. It's an interesting image. Okay, admittedly, 
Very British. But. <laughs> Why did God not become incarnate multiple on multiple occasions? That would be convenient, right? I mean, there would be a Jesus in every age. Well, he'd have a different name, and we would meet him on the street. <laughs> there would be a lot of crucifixions of God. Now, that's not a question Aquinas. Actually, the, Aquinas, the question Aquinas asks is, could God have done it? He does think that if the Son of God became incarnate multiple times, that each of those individual human natures would have been the same person. Right? So you'd have three people, for example, and they would all be the one person of the Son made man. That's very unfitting. That's weird. He thinks God could have done it, but it just make it just, so right away. Actually, there you do have one of the that's the seed of one of the modern answers to this question. This is treated by, among others, Charles Journet in the 20th century. And uh, Charles Journet was a Swiss cardinal, great Catholic theologian, and a Thomist. And um, Journet says uh, it's got to do with knowing the unique identity of God. God became human only once so that we would know the one God who there is in the most effective means possible. If God had become incarnate multiple times, we would be able to envisage God, as it were, under different faces, and you could imagine the the rivals of uh, explan- the rival explanations. Well, no, I mean, I think he's, I think he's the incarnate God. No, I think he's the incarnate Lord. Yeah, and you, you can create a kind of, um, imp- I mean, it's an argument from fittingness because God could, I suppose, give you the grace to make people clear on this. But the danger is that you get a kind of implicit polytheism. If there's only one God and God becomes incarnate once, then the one incarnation allows you best to know who the one God is. And so it's a sort of fittingness to the one God becoming incarnate once. That's sort of Journey's argument. Uh, it's interesting. That I've talked to missionaries in India who said that you know they'll talk about the incarnation, and very pious and devout Hindus will say to them, you know, but we have many incarnations. I mean, I have no problem saying that Jesus is an incarnation of God, but we have many manifestations of God. Why do you want to be so limiting? You know? And it's, it makes sense in a certain way. It's sometimes called by modern theologians the scandal of particularity. That it's scandalous that God has chosen one people in particular to be his chosen people, that's to say Israel, and that he should be, choose to become this one human being, Christ. But the scandal of particularity also is part of the true Christian universality. When you have multiple savior figures, what you get is clanic polarities of salvation. I'm from this place. We get saved by that God. You are from that place. You get saved by that God. But strangely, Judaism through Catholicism gives us the idea that God has taken on this particular pathway into the world in Christ, through the Israelite prophets and in Christ, so that all of humanity can be reconciled universally in the one saving truth of God. You know, so that Catholicity, Catholic in Greek means universal. The universality of Christ is connected to the scandal of particularity. It's the most universal religion, and it's the most incarnate, particularist understanding of religion. God only became this one person, this one human being, born of this one mother. But these, this person, Christ, has relevance as Savior for all human beings. This has also to do with the unity of the Catholic Church, that the unicity of the religion founded by Christ is a remedy to the fragmentation of human division, human uh, religious confusion. If you look at human history, there's deep confusion in human religion. I mean, there are a lot of barbar- there are a lot of beautiful things in, in in non-Catholic religions and things that we can learn from and engage with. But there's also been a lot of religious barbarism. Of course, the Catholic Church has not been freed from religious barbarism. But the idea that uh, is is that sometimes the, the the barbarism gets into the principles of the religion itself. I'm thinking of things like human sacrifice, which has been a predominant a practice in, in a lot of archaic religions. It's gone now from the world, by and large. But it's gone now from the world, by and large, because of Christian missionaries, among other things. Now, that's not a very politically correct thing to say today, but it doesn't mean that it's false. So, I mean, Christ has in many ways purified and elevated human religion. And it's just last argument is from the unity of the human race. I mean, it, it, it's a way in which Christ being the, sometimes the theologians call him the omega point. The final, de- that's like in Greek letters, alpha is the first letter, omega is the final. 
letter, and Christ says in the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I was dead and I am now alive. And because he is in the resurrection, the final point of the resurrections are kind of anticipation of the, of the end of creation, of the sort of final purpose of creation, that God is going to redeem the world in the resurrection from the dead. If Christ is truly risen from the dead, then he's the beginning of the new creation. And in that sense, he gives perspective to the human race in a way that one man alone does, one person alone. Actually, the resurrection of the Virgin Mary, her bodily assumption into heaven, makes her also the new Eve. So you have the new Adam and the new Eve who are this kind of embodiment of the new creation. Okay, how does the incarnation relate to the mystery of the atonement? We have alluded to this, but now I want to tackle it a little bit more directly. I mean, I can't, there's a, there's a lot in Aquinas on this subject matter. I think I gave you, yes, I gave you the third objection. So what I did here on, in, the, in your text, do you have, see, objection three there? Yeah, what I did in this text is I gave you one of the objections. Then I gave you the said contra, where he uses the argument from authority. Then I gave you the body of the argument, and then I gave you the response to that one objection. Whether he asks in question, this is, we're, now we, we've moved to the question 46 of, the, of this treatise on, the, of, on Christ. And this is about Christ's sufferings in the Passion. The, the larger question is about what Christ underwent in the Passion. And he asked, this, he asked this question, whether it was necessary for Christ to suffer for the deliverance of the human race. So you see how it's connected to the incarnation. Did God have to become incarnate? Well, kind of, not totally. It was highly fitting. Does he need to suffer? No, but it's going to be very fitting that he does. Like, how is the suffering of Christ in the incarnation, in the, in the, in the passion, related to our redemption? So there's an objection here that's helpful. It's written in the psalm. All the ways of the Lord are mercy and truth. But it does not seem necessary that he should suffer on the part of divine mercy, which, it, it, which as it bestows gifts freely, so it appears to condone debts without satisfaction. I mean, God, this is the objection that the gentleman uh, was, was posing in the last question and answer series. Uh, it's basically, look, God's merciful. He doesn't need to ask Christ to suffer on our behalf. Yes, right. Nor again on the part of divine justice, according to which man deserved everlasting con condemnation. He means hell. Therefore, it does not seem necessary that, God, that Christ should have suffered from man's deliverance. The second objection is like, he could have just damned us. So it's not really necessary because God's, I mean, God could do that. God is infinitely just. He could just hold us under the pain of eternal justice. And that would be the only side of God we ever saw. Right? I answer that as the philosopher teaches, that's Aristotle. He calls Aristotle, that's his nickname for Aristotle. There are several acceptations of the word necessary. It was not necessary for Christ to suffer from necessity of compulsion, either on God's part who ruled that Christ should suffer or on Christ's own part who suffered voluntarily. So it's not like I think, oh, I've got to be merciful to them. I've got to be merciful to them. I'm going to become incarnate. No, I've got to be just. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm holding fast to my justice. You know, God has done things freely. He does them freely by goodness and wisdom. Like he, when he does, acts freely, he acts out of his goodness and his wisdom. Nor did Christ have to, Christ did not take on the passion in his human will, not, nor the, not, neither as God, nor in his human will does Christ take on his passion by compulsion. Right? God the Father really wants to do this. God the Son's not so sure. No, no, no. There's one God and the God they have, there's one will. Anyway. But it was necessary of the end proposed, and this can be accepted in three ways. So again, this is a kind of necessity of fittingness. First, on all, first of all, on our part, who have been delivered by his passion. So he says, was it necessary? Well, for us it was, because that's the way God saved us. Right? So he could have saved us otherwise, but given that he saved us this way, we should sort of say, it's necessary for us. You know, it's a, it's a, kind, of, it's a, it's a kind of a qualified understanding of necessity. The Son of Man must be lifted up, says Jesus, that whoever believes in him may not perish, may have eternal life, life everlasting. So notice he gets his argument there from Jesus himself. The Son of Man must be lifted up. So, so Jesus says it's necessary in the sense that Jesus says that he must go to his death so that we can be saved. We've been saved because Jesus went to his death. So in that sense, it's necessary. The Lord willed to take on the mystery of the atonement and the cross to save us. The Son of Man must be lifted up. It's a, 
It's a conditional necessity. If God wills to save us this way, then Christ in his human life, in his human nature, has to accept the burden of the crucifixion. Secondly, on Christ's part, who merited the glory of being exalted through the resurrection, through the lowliness of his passion, and to this must be referred Luke 24, ought not Christ to have suffered these things so as to enter into his glory. That's Jesus, that word is from the, the, the road to Emmaus. That's the resurrected Christ walking with the disciples who don't recognize him. And he begins to, to sort of um, um, rebuke them and saying, you have not understood what's happening. Did you not understand that the Messiah must suffer so that he could enter into his glory? Now, that's, again, a kind of argument from fittingness. There's a fittingness that the Messiah should suffer. It's scandalous to them that the Messiah was crucified. They can't believe in Jesus. He said he would save us. He said he would save Israel. And now he's died. And he says to them, did you not understand that this must happen this way? that it was an atoning death, that the death was meaningful so that you could enter into redemption. And then he breaks bread and they feel their hearts burning within them. It's a Eucharistic image. So we find the risen Christ in the Eucharist. Thirdly, on God's part, whose determination regarding the passion of Christ foretold in the scriptures and prefigured in the observances of the Old Testament had to be fulfilled. That's also from conditional necessity. God has already started down the road of the atonement, uh, early from early on in the covenant with the people of Israel. So already in the mystery of Abraham and Isaac, in the mystery of the sacrifices of the Mosaic law, you have prefigurations of the one saving uh, death of Christ. So the, given that he'd already started down this road of redeeming us in this way, then he's committed to it, so to speak. Once he makes promises to Israel, he's going to fulfill those promises. Once he promises to redeem the human race, he's going to redeem the human race. And again, he, he, what he's doing, he's making sense of Jesus' own words. When Christ talks about this necessity of suffering his passion, he's saying he's, he's do, he must suffer to merit our salvation. He must suffer in order to give us eternal life. He must suffer in order to fulfill the Old Testament teachings. Uh, so it's a kind of internal, a necessity internal, you might say, to a divine logic or divine wisdom that God has decided to redeem us in a certain way. And once he commits to that, he falls through on it. And there's a certain beauty in it. It's a beauty of Christ's lowliness, and it's a beauty of Christ's uh, exaltation. God decided in the, in, the, in the mystery of his own crucifixion, God willed to, to enter into our human lowliness in solidarity with us, in death, and even to suffer uh, at the hands of, of human beings and sinners, so that he could... Uh, be exalted and become the principle of our salvation. It's kind of what I was going back to earlier with Julian Norwich. God decided to enter into what was the worst of situations that we could do in order to bring about the best possible good to bless us. And once he entered into this, you might say, beautiful logic of salvation, he's committed to it and Christ is committed to it. And you see it in Christ's own words in the Gospels. Now he replies to the third objection, and this is a very interesting and beautiful teaching. That I alluded to in the answers to last session, the questions in last session, that man should be delivered by Christ's passion was in keeping with both his mercy and his justice. Okay, so that God should become incarnate and that God should redeem us through the passion of Christ is both merciful and just. It's in keeping with his justice because by his passion, Christ made satisfaction or atonement for the sin of the human race. And so man was set free by Christ's justice. And so God became our brother in our human life so that we could become his brother in the life of grace, so that we could profit from what Christ has done and be joined to him in his charity, in his obedience, in his love, uh, and in his mercy, so that we as Christians might belong to Christ in his grace and partake of his victory. And with his mercy, for since man of himself could not make atonement or satisfy for the sin of all human nature, as was said above, God gave him his son to satisfy for him, according to Romans 3, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has proposed to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That beautiful phrase of Paul is really rich with theology. Propitiation means a kind of intercessor or one who offers what is required to God. So Christ made an offering of himself to God so that we who believe in him, have faith in his blood, might be redeemed by his grace. And he says, this is the famous line, 
This came of more copious mercy than if he had forgiven sins without this satisfaction. And so it says in Ephesians 2, God who is rich in mercy for his exceeding charity wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together in Christ. It's the most profound depths of God's mercy that he's communicated to us the life of justice in Christ. Now, when we hear justice, most of the time as Americans, people in America, we're going to think in terms of legal justice, um, almost monetary terms. You know, I paid that much. I get this much remuneration. Um, maybe in terms of the equal human rights. Okay. I deserve this. He deserves that. She deserves this. He deserves that. And those are, those are instances of justice. But in the New Testament, this kind of justice that's being talked about is a mystery. It's a mystery. There's a justice in Christ that we can, we can kind of understand. It's a, but it's a mystery of um, being, it's something like the justice that's present in friendship. Aristotle says, you can be just towards other people without being their friends, but you cannot be friends with someone without being just toward them. So justice is a condition for friendship and justice finds its perfection in friendship. So like if I'm friends with someone, but they keep, I don't know what, stealing my, my stealing food out of my refrigerator. I don't know what it is people do to each other you know, that could upset you. Um, <laughs> borrowing money from me, they don't pay. Or in the Dominican order, especially grievous, most terrible injustice, borrowing books you don't give back. <laughs> that is a terrible injustice. You can't be friends with those people. <laughs> If they're your friends, if you loan them the books, they bring them back in justice, right? Uh, otherwise, you have to live in continual mercy towards those people. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so the idea is that, you know, we, it's, we can live, how do we live in friendship with God best? Not only through, through sheer mercy, but it's a greater mercy when God gives us the justice in Christ, the grace in Christ, this mystery of restoration of our dignity and grace that we can live in friendship with God. I mean, that's what it's really about in the end. The atonement is about restoring our friendship with God. Okay, I'm going to finish with this last article. This is from the question on baptism, uh, whether baptism should remedy all the ills of this life. And I'm putting this here at the end to ask, why does moral and physical evil exist in the world after the incarnation? This is the magic wand objection. I'm very happy, oh, oh God, I'm very happy you became human. I'm very happy you want to give me eternal life. I'm very happy that you are interested in, in curing all the remedies and ills of this life. However, I would just like to ask you to do it all immediately, that I not have to live in the obscurity of faith, suffer at all in this world, or, or uh, be subject to any doubts about your provident goodness and the fact that you're going to overcome all the terrible, wicked ills that are subject, that the world is subject to, and that, in fact, I'm contributing to daily by, in small and large ways. Right? That's, it's basically that objection. Which is the most important, you know, kind of, that is a, you know, it's a very serious one. Okay. And Aquinas' answer is going to be, well, there's a mystery of part of cooperation. You cooperate. The atonement, the incarnation and the atonement are also about us living with Christ in the midst of human suffering. And he who is crucified will give us the strength or, you know, to endure conformity to the cross in view of conformity to the resurrection. So this is the part where the fact that we have sinned collectively as a human race and individually as individual persons meet, does not mean we get off the hook. Yes, he's done everything to save us, but we have to kind of appropriate that. And part of the way we appropriate that is through uh, living in Christ in the midst of our own human suffering. And the suffering of others uh, are the origin of for us, too. I mean, we can suffer gravely at the hands of others. That doesn't mean that God wills evil, okay? Aquinas thinks God never wills moral evil, either directly or indirectly. It's not even that he just like tolerates it because he thinks it's somehow good for you. God just tolerates e moral evil only because he respects free will. And it's always contrary to God's will in a certain sense, Aquinas says. Like moral, every moral evil is a transgression of the divine will. But God does not annihilate us after we uh, do acts of moral evil. And that, that has huge consequences because that means God leaves us all on a long leash. Right? If you have free will and God respects your free will, then he'll allow us to do every evil of which free will is capable. And if you look at the history of human nature, it's a history of human beings in many ways doing all the evils they're capable of. Right? So, I mean, God respects human freedom and he allows human beings to do great evil. He will remedy all of that either by mercy or by justice. 
but he is not causing it or willing it. That's very important to say as a preface. So in the midst of that, he says, I answer that baptism has the power to take away the penalties. When he says penalties, it's a word in Latin, pene, the sufferings. It means sufferings. It can mean punishments. It, it, it doesn't have to mean things that, it doesn't mean God penalizing us. It means, or at least not primarily, it means primarily the things we've done to ourselves through sin, starting from the original sin of Adam, that the fallen world, like God doesn't take away all the sufferings of, this, of the fallen world. The baptism does not take away all the, fault, the, penalty, the, the sufferings, the, the, the fallen character of the present life. Yet it does, it, sorry, it has, says baptism does have the power to take them away, but it does not take them away during the present life. But by its power, they will be taken away from the just in the resurrection when the mortal puts on immortality. And he says, now that's reasonable. He say, no, it's not reasonable. I want you to take them all away right now. Uh, I don't like this. Uh, deferring everything to life after death. That just sounds too, it's not good enough and it's too good to be true. And okay, he's going to say, okay, but it is actually reasonable. First, because by baptism, man is incorporated into Christ and has made his member. He's made a member of the mystical body of the church. Consequently, it is fitting that what takes place in the head should be take place also in the member the, of the body incorporated. Now, from the very beginning of his conception, Christ was full of grace and truth, yet he had a body capable of suffering, which through his passion and death was raised up to a life of glory in the resurrection. Wherefore, a Christian receives grace in baptism as to his soul, but he retains a body subject to suffering, so that he may suffer for Christ therein, yet at length he will be raised up to a life of impassibility. Impassibility means freedom from suffering. This is a very deep statement. What he's saying is the grace of Christ is given to you primarily in the spiritual faculties of the soul, in your intellect and will. The primary way you participate already in redemption is through knowledge and love. Knowledge of Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Love of Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Love of your neighbor in Christ. And you live that in the midst of a body of suffering, which means also a psychology, sensate emotional psychology, which is largely of our animal nature. It's good, but it's part of the animal in us. Your bo animal body, your psych with the psyche, with the temperament you have, whether it's ecstatic or melancholic, whatever it is, you live out the mystery of your love for Christ and your knowledge of Christ in that human body, which is subject to death. Why? Well, because this is the time to choose love. This is the time to choose the truth. That's why the martyr is, in a way, the epitome of the Christian. The martyr bears witness to the truth of Christ in his or her mortal body unto death. And in a certain way, our time in this life is a time of conformity to the passion of Christ. Not just of external conformity, but of the, it's the deeper conformity is to use the, the sufferings that we are inevitably exposed to and the opportunities to remedy the sufferings of others and to serve others as opportunities to grow vitally in charity. And the project of this life in Christ, because of the incarnation and the redemption, is the project of growing in the knowledge and love of God and neighbor. It's the, the life of grace has a vitality to it. It's not just a once and for all thing. It's a living seed. It's a principle of eternal life in us, and the seed grows. And when we cooperate with Christ in charity and in truth in the course of our lives, we can grow in charity. And if we do that in the midst of a world of suffering and death, we actually have an almost infinite number of opportunities to live out the mercy, the charity, and the truth of Christ in the midst of a world of suffering and to become agents of Christ to remedy the sufferings of others, to bring them before God in prayer, to worship God in life and in death, and to become witnesses and martyrs of Christ in the midst of the world of suffering that we live in. So it's a cross-shaped redemption we are being saved in our minds and hearts, and we are being saved in the midst of bodies subject to suffering. But it's also a salvation that's a living principle in us where we can give ourselves and grow in Christ daily. And he says, hence, the apostle says that he that raised up Jesus from the dead shall quicken or enliven us also our mortal bodies because of the spirit that dwells in us. Like the body will be raised and glorified in the general resurrection. That's a Christian belief. But in this life, it's through mystery of conformity to crucifixion that we 
proportion ourselves, already ourselves, for the life of resurrection. We are conformed to the death and the resurrection of Christ. He says, secondly, it's suitable for our spiritual training, namely in order that by fighting against concupiscence, that's an old-fashioned, it's an it's a important word, but it's an old-fashioned a medieval word for like not just lust but possessiveness, kind of the the desires of uh, of of sensual possessiveness of the body, and other defects to which he is subject. Man may receive a crown of victory. Aquinas says it's harder for us to be chaste than it would have been had we never fallen because of the wounds of original sin, but it's more meritorious for us to be chaste uh, than it would have been for Adam and Eve had they never sinned. So he says, the struggle with our human sexuality in this world, which I don't know if anyone's told you, but there's a lot of people who have struggles with like being chastity. There's some issues there with our human race. So, uh, you know, grace helps us a great deal. Reg regular sacramental confession helps us a great deal make progress. But what he's saying is, yeah, it's a battle, but the battle is noble. And so the fighting the battle is part of like the spiritual warfare of the human being. And he's thinking beyond uh, human sexual issues to like just the, more generally the growth, the struggle against vice. Like we live in this time where we can actually grow in merit. Uh, that Christ, when I talk about the incarnation being a principle of perfection, Christ, I mean, Aquinas thinks that Christ's perfection deploys in the sacraments and can instigate uh, moments of perfection in us to help us in the midst of our miseries and limits and sins become uh, more conformed to the charity of Christ and more noble. And that's like, you know, in an interesting way, it gives life meaning because it makes life a project worth living. You know, life is not just a one humdrum passing of time through banal events or just, you know, a string of addictions and sins from one to the next uh, or, you know, bad mistakes and prudentially questionable judgments. It's life as actually is a project of fighting to live the, the life of the redeemed, to live in Christ. And we're all qualified eminently for this because the only qualification necessary to seek perfection in Christ is to be a sinner. So if you are not a sinner, you're not qualified to live this. I'm sorry, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> you should go and be with the perfect. Uh, I suspect you're probably all in the right place. And uh, the rest of the human race as, as well. Thirdly, this was unsuitable lest man might see. This is my favorite one. This is unsuitable. This was suitable that you, you, you get baptized, but you still have to struggle and you still suffer and die. This is a suitable lest men seek to be baptized for the sake of impassibility in the present life and not for the sake of the glory of eternal life. Wherefore the apostle says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable. His point is, if you got baptized and then you didn't die, like everybody lined up to get baptized, right? I'd like to be baptized, right? I mean, you know, now you'd have to give conditions. Well, actually, you also have to be chaste. You have to obey God. You have to do, well, I mean, okay, but then I won't die, right? So, I mean, if it were, if, if God gave some kind of, um, you might call it history ending grace, you know, kind of end of the world graces punctually to whoever was baptized, it would, it would cause us to have different motives. And those motives could be, in fact, fundamentally selfish. And here's the idea is that God is actually going for the heart. Yeah, so being subject to death, Augustine says, God has left us in the throes of human mortality so that we don't suffer uh, eternal death. So we're subject to human death in time so that we will seek remedy in God and not be subject to eternal death. And Pascal says, God has given enough light to every man that each one shall be without excuse. But he leaves enough obscurity in the life of each man that we must choose freely to love. So that's this idea that, you know, there's a kind of a a discernment being made in the life of each of us to seek the truth and try to find the truth and live in the truth freely. And so baptism doesn't do something magical. It gives people the strength to bear witness to Christ and to become, you might say, truth bearers in the world. But the decision to be baptized, the decision to live for Christ, even unto death, the decision to bear witness to Christ, even unto death, is a decision made in freedom and so it's made in the, you might call it still in the obscurity of faith, the, the non-evidence of faith. God likes the obscurity of faith much more than we do because it tests the metal of our hearts and it purifies our hearts. And it makes, it's a way in which God teaches us to serve him freely and not to serve him out of uh, uh, mixed motives of, of, of gain 
or you know through manipulative practices of trying to get something from him. It, it, it causes us to serve him in absolute sincerity of heart. So the mystery is going on, and it's also part of part of the mystery is going on is the mystery of the purification of our hearts by conformity to Christ over time, wherein we give everything. We give everything to God in faith, and God gives us everything in Christ. So it really is a mystery of shared love and not a mystery of utilitarian usage or friend, utilitarian friendship with God, right? A quid pro quo relationship. Yeah. Now that's challenging, but it's also very beautiful. It's like God has called what's most noble in us to himself, to love him freely and to love the truth freely.